All right, thank you everyone uh, very much. Good morning, uh, my name is Josefina Tavarria. I'm the director of the Peace Accords Matrix of the Kroc Institute Kiel School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. And it is a real pleasure uh, to say good morning, welcome everyone here at the Kiel School in DC and also all the friends that are uh, joining us online. We've had uh, almost, I think, over 600 people register for this online event. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to know that there's so much interest in the topic that bring us all together, which is uh, overcoming violence in wounded societies, perspectives from the Colombian and uh, Kenyan Truth Commissions. Um, we are joined today by a wonderful group of uh, scholars, practitioners, and survivors uh, who have had firsthand experience uh, in armed conflict, but also in bringing together truth commissions to investigate and shed light on different abuses of human rights. And um, we have been doing this work at the University of Notre Dame for many years. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to also come and look at the, at the Transmedia Comisión de la Verdad.co to look at the digital files of the Truth Commission of Colombia. We at the University of Notre Dame are the custodians of this public digital archive uh, that we have taken to simply uh, trying to take good care of that in perpetuity for all victims of the conflict, for civil society, but also for researchers policymakers to really go online and try to not only understand what was uh, what was the what were the reasons the patterns for violence in the Colombian armed conflict but also how we were able to take a deep look at what happened look at each other in the eyes and try to move forward towards reconciliation so um, this complements our work uh, following uh, monitoring the implementation of the peace accord and what we would like to uh, bring together in these different spaces for dialogue is to really reflect, uh, share with each other lessons about what we have learned of transitional justice mechanisms, peace accords, and larger processes of peace building. And I think that today we have this wonderful round table uh, to you know, have this conversation for half an hour. I would like to hand over the floor to Leslie Wingender from Humanity United, who will be our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Josefina. Uh, welcome, good morning to everyone. Welcome to everyone who is online. We are happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Leslie Wingender. I am a director at the Peace Build, on the peace building team at Humanity United, and it is my great privilege to be able to moderate this amazing panel. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how to overcome uh, cycles of violence. And really, we have here four panelists who will be sharing their personal experiences of, of seeking truth, both in formal processes and in informal processes. So we, I have here, we have Karina Ruiz, who is a survivor of the armed conflict in Colombia. She's living here in the United States, and she is also a participant of the Foto Diasporas group, which they will be sharing more about. We have Padre de Rue, uh, who is the former chair of the Commission of Clarification, Truth, Coexistence, and Non-Repetition in Colombia. We have Tekla Namantaja, former vice and acting chair of the Kenya Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission. And we have Gloria Marcela, a Colombian survivor of the armed conflict living here in the United States and also a participant of the Foto Diasporas group. And the Foto Diasporas group is an, uh, a group seeking um, in exile. They, they came together to seek truth. And so I also want to say un bienvenido a todos que están en, en online mirando esto, uh, the, the photo voice groups. You're very welcome and excited that you're participating and so thankful to have you two as the representatives. So with that, um, I think we have an amazing opportunity this morning to really think uh, from the diverse perspectives of these four panelists on um, how do you grapple with the truth? How do you grapple with what has happened um, during an armed conflict? And so um, we have here experiences from two different contexts, from Colombia and from Kenya. We will be focusing more on the, your personal perspectives and engagement 
in, in, in your um, seeking of truth. But before we get into that, I would like to help frame the conversation by asking Padre de Ru and Tecla to give us just a sense of what was the mandate of the commission and the, um, the purpose that you were seeking for Colombia and for Kenya. So I'll start with you, Padre de Ru, to give us some insight into what the Colombian Truth Commission was about. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for being present here. Uh, thank you, Josefina, and the Croc Institute and the University of Notre Dame. You have been a great support for us all the time. Very happy to be here with Tecla. Tecla, you remind me of Angelita, Angela. She was a fantastic, fantastic black woman working for us a commissioner in Colombia who died for, uh, from COVID when she was working with community during the time of the Colombian Truth Commission. I'm very happy being here with Karina and Marcela and their project, this fantastic uh, project of Autodiaspora. Excuse me, but now um, the Colombian Commission, you know in Colombia we have gone through through uh, an internal armed conflict during 60 years. More than 9 million survivors, more than 120 young people died killing each other in the battle, battlefield in Colombia. Uh, people from the Colombian Army paramilitaries and guerrillas. We have more than 40,000 massacres, more than 50,000 kidnapping in Colombia. Remember women, for instance, for se seven, five, seven years, uh, completely isolated from the families, young women, young mothers uh, in the jungle. We have more than 18 children who were recruited by the guerrillas and the paramilitaries to the war. Uh, women, children, abused by the commanders, forced to make abortion. Uh, we have, uh, especially the suffering of the African Colombians and the indigenous in Colombia, by the way, the work came in their territories and they were displaced. More than seven million people displaced in Colombia. And the responsibility of the Colombian Truth Commission was to clarify the tragedy, to receive the victims. So we went through more than 30,000 victims. We received in 20 hours, 28 houses for truth we have in the country and also to dignify the victims and the survivors and to work for reconciliation in the country and to produce a document, a report, ending in recommenda recommendation for uh, peace in Colombia. Mm. Uh, at the same time, we were producing the report that we have already released seven months ago but we had also the idea and the decision to mobilize the country. So, and, and this was very impressive. Every day, every, every day during 40 months, there was an event in Colombia about confrontation with the truth. We have victims and perpetrators. We have television programs. We have through discussions in the territories, we have indigenous peoples, black communities. We had women, LGBT people, I mean, campesinos uh, uh, everywhere. So this is the reason I, have, I am so happy to have here uh, Karina from Jopal, a territory that impressed me enormously because of the conflict. 
And finally, uh, we are inviting the Colombian people to reconciliation. These are the basic points of us. Thank you very much. Keka? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Leslie. I must say that uh, I'm honored to share this space with Karina uh, Gloria and my spiritual leader, uh, Father. Um, and thank you uh, for coming to be with us today. Uh, concerning the Kenyan Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission, uh, in 2007, Kenya conducted its fourth multi-party general elections since the introduction of multi-parties in, in Kenya. And the presidential election was um, closely contested uh, between the incumbent uh, president, uh, the late Mwai Kibaki, and the opposition leader, uh, His Excellency Raila Odinga. And when the results were announced, amid this tension of rigging, uh, clashes erupted between um, the supporters of the president and the opposition leader in which we lost uh, over 1,300 people and 600,000 people were displaced and we had a lot of destruction of uh, property. The nation was unable to deal with the situation thanks to the African uh, Union. A mediation process was set in place led by His Excellency the late uh, Kofi Annan and two eminent African leaders. Uh, one of them was the late president, former president of Tanzania, uh, Benjamin Mkapa, and the current uh, first lady of South Africa, Gracia Marshall. They brokered a peace a deal, and one of the resolution was they advised Kenya to look into its painful past by investigating uh, historical injustices and cross violation of human rights that the country has experienced from independence in 1963 up to the signing of the peace agreement, which was uh, February uh, 2008. Uh, one of the mechanism that was put in place was a truth justice and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, and to implement this task, we had nine commissioners, uh, three international, and six Kenyans. Now, among the issues that the commission investigated were massacres, torture, extrajudicial killings, uh, assassinations, displacement of uh, communities, gender-based violence, marginalization, socioeconomic crimes, illegal and irregular allocation of land. We invited uh, Kenyans who had suffered the violations under investigation to record statements, and we received over 40,000 statements, out of which we selected 1,000 as window cases, and we conducted uh, hearings uh, individual hearings, institutional hearings, thematic hearings, uh, women's hearings, and children's uh, hearings. And then we <coughs> came up with our report and the recommendation. We submitted the report to the president in May 2013, and he submitted it to um, parliament. Parliament was supposed to review the report and set uh, mechanisms for implementation 
in place. It's 10 years now. The report is still in parliament. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Tekla. Mm -hmm. And Padre Very de Roo for that yeah. framing of both the contexts. Mm -hmm. So with that, we want to get into some questions for all of the panelists about your experiences with on the Truth Commission or in, or in uh, initiatives for seeking truth and sharing. So Padre de Roo, my first question is more um, around in the findings of the Truth Commission, what was the role that religion played, um, if any, in, in the findings or as part of, part of the final report? Well, I have to say that the presence of the Catholic Church, but also the Mennonites and some others of the, our friends, commu religious communities in Colombia, was very important with the communities, basically. Uh, thanks to the churches, we have the presence of the survivors in La Habana, in the middle of the conversation between the FARC people and the Colombian government. And it was the, pr the presence of the, the victims, the survivors, there was determinant for both of them, the government and the guerrillas, to understand that the problem was really human beings in Colombia. Uh, also because in, in the different, we have thousands of parishes in Colombia and, and everywhere the social pastoral of the Colombian Truth Commission of, of the Catholic Church in Colombia were very effective. The Mennonites were impressive in the work for giving you an idea. And, uh, and now, the, the question we have as Catholics in Colombia, I, I have two basic questions. The, the first one is, how is it that we killed, we killed each other being Catholics in Colombia and Christians? I mean, I, was, I have to say 70, today 70% or 72% of the Colombians are Catholic baptized, but more than 90% all of us were Christians and Christian but baptized people and we killed and we killed each other uh, uh, and we killed each other in, 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 in Colombia which is terrible so what sort of evangelization we had in Colombia how is the formation we gave to people in terms of reconciliation forgiveness Real, real love, because we were killing each other as followers of Jesus. What is the meaning of that? And the other question is um, the necessity to have a public recognition of the church in Colombia, of the participation of the church. You know, we had two very different moments in the Colombian history of violence. During the first part of the last century, the church, I mean priests, even bishops, were participating in the conflict between Catholics, conservative, and liberal, and even socialist Catholics. In the last part, the church was very committed in the process of peace, and even they were supporting us in the Truth Commission. And I have to, to express my gratitude to, to the presence here of the, 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 the support of the Catholic Church in the United States. And, and, and we have three bishops who are killed, uh, several, several nuns and priests, and many, many lay people, many, many lay people. Mm. Okay, this is for the church. Uh, uh. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Father de Leroux. And I, from there, you started to get into a little bit, but your position, you were the, um, in your Jesuit uh, tradition, you were the only commissioner who, commissioner and chair. What role did that, did spirituality play for you as part of um, being on the commission? And, and now that you're 10 months after the end of the mandate, just what are some of your reflections on that role? Leslie, it was very important. At Truth Commission, as you know, 
Tecla is always a process of personal purifi purification, very profound. I mean, you are challenged with very, very profound spiritual confrontations. Being the president of the Colombian Truth Commission, one of my responsibilities was to preserve the freedom and the independence of the Colombian Truth Commission. I mean, independence from powers, from ideologies, from political parties, and to maintain the idea only the truth, only the truth, and the human truth, the truth of the victims, which is the most important issue. Always, all the time I maintain in my heart the, the most important question in the history of humanity. Where is your brother? Where is your sister? This is much more important than the question who is God, where is God, because you know it well in John epistles, if you don't recognize your brother, your sister, don't, don't talk about God, because nobody is going to understand what are you talking about. This is very important. This is why I was all the time against or trying not to confuse people with numbers. To give you an example, 4,200 American soldiers died, were killed in the invasion of the United States to Iraq. This is a number we have now. It means nothing. Each one of these young people were a person with illusions, with dreams, with family, with children. And the question is about him or she. And the Truth Commission does that. I mean, we receive each one of the victims, and we try to, of the survivors, and we try to accompany them and to clarify the, what really will happen with them. And uh, to be honest, participating in the Truth Commission, I mean in the drama, in the tragedy, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We had a million Colombian Colombians in this in the exile. In 24 countries, we were also having conversations. Doing all of that is then entering into the hell, the, the hell of the, the suffering of the people and the confusion of the perpetrators because we have to work for reconciliation for everybody. And uh, all the time, you have to be confronted. And in many cases, you have the, the difficulty of, are we going to tell the truth? It be, it's going to be very risky. It's a challenge. Or we prefer to maintain silence. And, and we have to pass through this. Through, through this. And, 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 and to tell the truth, no matter no matter the costs, which is absolutely important. Mm, always maintaining the idea of the, the question, how do you dare? I mean, how do you dare to accept that you are humans? Having more than 9 million victims in Colombia, how do you dare, how do you dare to maintain you are, you are Christians? You are Catholics in a situation like this. This is a very strong question for us. As if you have any responsibility as a spiritual leader in, in a situation like the one we have in Colombia. So uh, I have to be very honest with you. I have the conviction that War, after 60 years of war in Colombia, war is absolutely stupid. War never, never solve problems. The war start, starts for, in Colombia, for instance, we have a social problem. We have a problem. It was a land problem. Uh, campesinos, uh, peasants, were asking for land in Colombia at the end of the, 
the 50s, beginning of the 60s in Colombia. And instead of solving a problem which was a social problem in a political way, in a negotiation with the campesinos, with the peasants, we decided to go to war. It was the time of the Cold War, and it was mixed with the Cold War, the fighting against the communists. And finally, we never stopped the war in Colombia. And the whole society was involved in some of other way. And the war always degradates, degradates always, and always the, those who suffer the most because of the war are the people who don't want the war. The war is imposed on them. So I, I really, I really want to, to invite you, please, you have to work for reconciliation all the time. Uh, war is, is complicate things and uh, make the problems uh, far more difficult. Thank you so much, Pastor Debo, for sharing, for sharing that and for that call and for um, yeah, the reflection on, on who we are as a society. I think also for, for Colombia, for the United States, I think in so many contexts. The role. Um, I wanted to turn now to Karina and ask you, um, in the experience that you had, uh, you had to leave the country because of the armed conflict. You were a victim of the armed conflict. What role has um, your own journey, your own spiritual journey played as you've come to the United States and engaged in seeking the truth? And I'm going to do a Translation for Karina. Buenos días. Good morning. Eh, mi nombre es Karina. Vengo de la parte oriental de Colombia. My name is Karina. I come from the east of the country. Eh, bueno, es una palabra, una pregunta muy buena y un poquito difícil de responder. This is a good question, but also a very difficult question to answer. Eh, aún, ¿cómo, ¿cómo fue mi proceso? So for, what was my process? Eh, aún adole eh, menor de edad, mi madre es asesinada por la guerrilla, el grupo del ELN. So as mm. I was underage, uh, when my mother was assassinated by the ELN, the guerrilla group. Eh, es, es algo que tiene uno que vivirlo para entender eh, cómo es el dolor it's something that you need to live to know that type of pain. In ese momento se pierde la esperanza de un futuro mejor. In that moment, I lost the um, hope for a better future. Llegan eh, sentimientos. Okay, sentimientos okay. o emociones negativas muy destructivas a pesar de lo que se ha vivido pues llegan emociones que nos siguen afectando y no nos dejan avanzar and from that experience there's so many negative emotions that just keep you from from moving forward and they keep coming back eh, sentimientos de venganza odio rencor y Querer hacer como lo mismo que se recibió. And feelings of hatred, vengeance, um, bitterness, and it makes you want to also do something like that. Y como decía el Padre Francisco, eh, una comunidad eh, que está sembrando odio, rencor, eh, si seguimos en lo mismo, no vamos a ver la paz y no es lo que queremos. And how Father, Father Francisco said, um, a community that sows uh, bitterness, hatred, um, it won't advance. Llegó un momento en cuanto a la parte, cómo, cómo trabajar esa parte personal y espiritual, eh, sanar. So there came a point for me on how do I deal with this personal healing this personal moment. Había fueron sembrado valores eh, y también pues como ese 
esa parte espiritual. ¿sí? I Lo, had um, already these values and some spiritual, spiritual journey. Que me llevó a, a entender y a trabajar que si yo profeso, digo que soy cristiana, que creo en ese ser superior, eh, tengo que perdonar y amar, ¿sí? Amar al prójimo. So, and then I'm, I'm a Christian, and so those values of, I realized I need to forgive, um, to heal. No fue un proceso fácil. Me negué muchas veces y hasta llegar a pelear con Dios. It was not an easy process, and I, I even had to fight with God. Creer que porque él había permitido esas cosas. Why would he allow these things to have happened? Mm. Me costó, pero llegó el momento que lo entendí y sabía que si quería un país empezando por mí misma, mi vida debía de cambiar y se debía de perdonar para it, seguir avanzando. It, it, was, it was very hard, but I realized that if I wanted to have a different country, it needed to start with me and I needed to forgive and, and heal. Eh, trabajar esa parte espiritual y lo personal fue también como la parte de la resiliencia, eh, ver que um, todas las adversidades eh, las podemos cambiar con nuestra actitud, con, con la fuerza, con querer salir adelante. So working on the spiritual journey for me was an act of resilience and recognizing that I can come out um, from, from this. En el momento de, de perdonar, ¿sí? eh, mirar las cosas no con, con odio, eh, sino desde otra perspectiva. Eh, In the act of um, forgiving, to no longer look at the things with hatred. Que lo mirara, pero no sintiera ese dolor, ¿no? That I could see what had happened, but no longer feel that, that same pain. Eh, empiezo a buscar, pues, salir de, de entornos que aún mm, no dejan avanzar. So this for me also, I needed to leave from outside of environments that didn't let me move forward. Ahí eh, decido venirme eh, a Estados Unidos buscando no, no, no recordar esa situación, sino... Eh, creer que podía avanzar mejor, ¿sí? And, and that's when I decided to come to the States um, and not be reflecting or remembering only what happened, but wanting to move forward into something new. Estar un poco más tranquila, no fue fácil llegar acá y eh, dejar mi país, dejar mi familia, no tener el idioma. Uh, coming here was not easy to leave my family to a new country, not having the language. Pero era poder decir que se puede volver a iniciar y coger esa fuerza que en, el, en un comienzo era, era más el, el, con les emociones negativas, pero traerlo a, a traer y a coger la fuerza para, para hacer las cosas mejor. But for me, it was I was able to. Perdón, la primera parte. I was able to turn. Me repites, por favor. Bueno, querer eh, venir acá y tener una fuerza, eh, tener fuerza para salir adelante, so cogiendo las debilidades y cambiándolas en fortalezas. So coming here for me was really taking those like weaknesses or or just changing that into something new while I was in the United States. Y entendí, ya había re, eh, repetido, pues que el, el odio a la que más me hacía daño era a mí. ¿sí? And I recognized that um, the hatred, really it was hurting me. Y el camino acá, iniciar, no fue fácil. And the coming here and starting my journey here has not been easy. Pero he podido enfrentarlo y decir que sí se puede. But I've been able to face it and be able to say that yes, I can. Y bueno, el mensaje es que no importan las circunstancias, las 
eh, situaciones difíciles, escoger eh, esas, esas situaciones y, y cambiarlas desde nuestra actitud. Poder, um, and so taking these hard situations, no matter what happens to you, but taking those and turning them into something different, that is really important. Poder uh, decirle a otras personas que están pasando o han pasado por lo mismo, que podemos avanzar, ¿sí? So we can, so I can share with other people who are going through similar situations that we can advance, we can move forward que podemos perdonar, podernos, podemos liberarnos. We can forgive, we can be liberated. Podemos encontrar la grandeza con la cual hemos sido creados. We can find the greatness from which we were made. Y por ende, pues nuestra vida va a ser diferente y nuestra ciudad, sociedad va a ser diferente. And then we will be different and our societies will be different. Gracias, Lindy. Gracias a todos ustedes. Thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Marce. Thank you for sharing that amazing story, and thank you for being so open with us. It really is a gift um, to have you here. Gracias, Lindy. Um, I wanted to turn now to Tecla, and, and we heard now from the Colombian experience and to, to specific people so far. I really wanted to hear from you. Uh, first, what have been some of the challenges you faced as vice chair and then acting chair of the commission, um, and then I'll enter into the question of what have you, what has been your personal journey also, to to get through those challenges. Thank you, and thank you, Karina. Thank you, and thank you, Karina. You've not just represented the victims uh, from Colombia, but from all over the world who have gone through the journey that you've uh, also gone through. Uh, concerning the challenges, when uh, I joined the commission, I was nursing a two-month-old baby. Victor seated behind there. <laughs> and uh, I had just done my master's in peace building. Uh, at Eastern Mennonite University, and I had done uh, restorative justice, and that is what I wanted to bring on the commission. So I said, for me, I would just be there for reconciliation. So during the meetings, I could just sit there because I was nursing a baby. But then the commission started experiencing challenges related to the, our chairman because of issues of uh, conflict of interest and credibility issues that forced the, the vice chair couldn't work with him, so she resigned. And when she resigned, I approached my uh, fellow commissioner woman, we were four of us, and I said, hey, can you take over because I'm nursing a baby I cannot do it. She told me, no, take like I cannot. So I, I took over. And before I realized, because of the issues affecting the chair, he was forced to step aside as the investigation took place. And I realized I was taking over as the acting chairman. Now, the first challenge that I experienced was that um, I took over the commission that had lost a whole one year because of fighting the challenges surrounding the chair. Yet the mandate was, all, was only two and a half years. So I had to really run uh, to finish the work of the commission and also to lobby parliamentarians because we had a clause where they could extend our uh, extension of our time. I had to lobby and it was extended. But more important to work on the credibility and the integrity of the commission. Kenyans had lost the trust. Kenyans had lost the hope. And even convincing the victims 
that this is a credible commission, you should come before it. I really took time to do that. So those are some of the challenges that I was uh, dealing with. Another challenge was that the issues of the chair divided the commission right in the middle. So I cannot say that all commissioners supported my leadership, but I had to work to build consensus uh, for us to finish the work. And the mandate of the commission was so wide. It's the first commission that maybe had socioeconomic issues to do with corruption, issues to, 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 to do with uh, uh, land, issues to do with marginalization. Again, as the time, it was too short. Yeah. Uh, what kept me going? My own journey. Um, as a Catholic, uh, during the time of the challenges, I used to pray a lot. We, the office was just next to uh, Consolata Shrine. And each uh, lunchtime, I used to go and pray. But it reached a place I had to go beyond praying, the way jo uh, uh, Paul say, work without action, prayer without action. And I think that is how I took over. So prayer for me helped me. And as you know, uh, truth seeking is very re-traumatizing, not just to the victims, to everybody who is involved, including the commissioners. And uh, I remember each Sunday I used to go to church and focus uh, my eyes on the cross. And during mass, I wet my chest with tears. They stopped when I went to receive, and I knew that I was ready to carry on um, the next week. And I think motherhood, because I come from the community that was affected by uh, clashes, I wanted a better Kenyan for my children, including the baby, I was nursing. And so for me, when I took over the commission, I considered it as another baby that I had to nurture. And during this time, I realized that uh, we have that inability because I thought I was a sheep. When you compare the sheep and the lion, I thought I was a sheep. But I realized there was a lion in me also. And I called on that lion at times for me to keep the commission going. Thank you. <laughs> Tekla, thank you so much. I really, I just really resonate with uh, just how amazing the role that you ended up st stepping into, that you were not, mm -hmm. um, you were not seeking that, and and you did that with with your son. I just mm -hmm. that is so inspiring. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, um, Marcela. I want to turn to you to to share a little bit more about how do you collectively seek truth, and based off of the experience with the Photo Diasporas group, can you share us more about the collective? Um, engagement that you had. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. You cannot listen me? Uh, now, better? Yes. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. It is such an honor for us as a, a survivors, victims, to be heard. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you, Tecla. Thank you, Padre Laru, um, for being here with us. This is a pleasure that not many has. Um, I would like to start sharing with you some memories of my past, just to introduce to you how we arrived to the Photo Diasporas group. Um, in my case, I was a child when everything started. I was almost four years old. And all the trauma we went, it was like four years long. Uh, we were victims of both groups, the paramilitares and guerrilla group. And we were forced to leave. 
uh, too many things at the same time. We were a big family and they wanted to recruit my sisters at the time and obviously kill my father and my mother. And we went to the city and they obviously prosecuted us for a long time. And, but at the end, they just lost trust of ourselves. And, and, and we were like, fine, you know? But at the time, the city was under the narco <laughs> situation. It was hard for us to, to survive there. And after that, in my family, in my case, my father and my mother, they didn't want to talk about the subject. It was like a taboo, you know? We were asked all the time, like, why we are not at the farm? Why we cannot go back anymore? And they were like, uh, oh, let's not talk about that. It's kind of sad, you know? <laughs> we lost family members that didn't want to leave at the time. Um, and they were like, uh, nope, we don't want to talk about it. We just leave it as it is. But we have, obviously, memories about when they visit us at night, in the middle of the night, just asking for the, the um, uh, for my father to go out to kill him, and we were hiding all the time, or leaving at 5 p.m. and just go to the jungle and then just return in the morning, uh, just to be safe. And when we were uh, contacted by uh, Luz Maria, who was the person in charge of the research. Uh, it was through an email in my case. Some of the group were like a phone call. Uh, I can speak for most of us that it was very uh, scary <laughs> because we didn't know if, us, if it was from the government or if it was another person trying to reach us. <laughs> uh, like, okay, they found us. Like, uh, again, this is horrible. Um, but though it was uh, a research that the government of Colombia wanted to do with the people living in exile in the United States in, in, with the University of Massachusetts. And since the history of my family, they were rich many times just to give the, their experience about the conflict. But my father and my mother were like, no, we don't want to talk about it. Just if you want to give us something back, we can talk about it, but we are not going to risk ourselves and waste our time. Like, this is not fair. Like, you are just reaching for us all the time, asking us again and again the same story, but not giving us something back. Not even psychological support or something. Like they promised at the beginning, like, you know, we are going to give you back your, your land and psychological support or maybe economical support for your children to be educated, but no, we were just left alone. What was so sad. And when I received the message, I was like, oh, this is interesting since I was a kid. Obviously for me it's different. I remember things differently than my father and my mother. And I was like, okay, let's give it a try. Let's see what they want to know. And, and it was like basic questions about what happened at the time, what was living in exile, why I was in the United States, and that, that kind of information. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is okay, not too many things. But it was the same, just asking questions and just leaving you like, okay, in the dark again. But then uh, with the results of the research, they decided to give something back because obviously they found out that too many people didn't receive something back every time they were asked for the information. And they were like, okay, let's do something extra uh, with uh, psychological support and let's tell the truth and your, share your experiences through pictures and words. Uh, that was our case. And this is like a, a methodology that is used to uh, heal or share or say what you want to say that having been hurt. And that is how the group Photo Diasporas uh, is born. Um, it was a process during three months. It was video calls since we were during the pandemic. Uh, at the beginning, it was hard, I have to tell you, since we have these uh, feelings of fear, even with ourselves as victims, because some were victimized for the guerrilla group or the paramilitaries, and you don't want to talk about it because you don't know who is who. <laughs> you are always scared. 
Um, but at the end, we were just relaxing a little bit more, sharing the stories, and we started to feel that we were not alone anymore. And obviously, it's not the, the part of leaving your country, but the part of living in the United States. That is completely another story. Because it's like no one is here to give you a hand. You're just alone, not knowing the language, no work. Your uh, educational uh, experience is not uh, valid anymore. You have to start from zero. It's like you're nobody. You lost your identity. Yeah. And you're in another uh, country, no family members, everything. Is, everyone is left behind. It's kind of sad and hard. Uh, and we have those moments in our uh, exhibition, in our work. Um, then, obviously, through the process and the writing and, and the pictures and all the research, just going inside ourselves, uh, it was really, really, really hard, but it was healing. And, and we got with the result of this beautiful exhibition that is very painful at the same time, as I'm telling you. But it's a way to express um, our frustration with the government since we were left with nothing, no answers, nothing at all. Even here in the States, when you go uh, asking for help since you are a victim, sometimes they don't believe you. They makes you go again through the process of the traumatizing moment, just uh, telling again and again and again the story and being re-victimized again. Like, okay, this is not fair, <laughs> uh, which is sad. It's a, a common group feeling, not just me. And that's why this is a privilege, just to be heard from all of you and the persons who were behind the, the project because it's, it's like an exclusive opportunity that not many have, as I was discussing with Father de la Rue uh, yesterday. Uh, the numbers are, maybe they're not real because you are scared of saying that you're a victim. Uh, maybe there are more victims out there that, you, <laughs> that we don't even know uh, until today. Even today in the country we know that uh, it, there is still violence for other groups and, you know, criminals. And um, uh, that's why uh, we, we did this project, accepted the invitation, and continue to uh, share the message with everyone that, that we can. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mar Marcela. And as you can see on the walls, we do have the exhibit up. Um, this is photo, photodiasporas.org. You can also, you can find the QR code on, on uh, a few of the, the photos. Um, there's one in the back there, there's one up here, and it's in English and in Spanish. And um, this is the collective images. So the group came together and had two different parts of the project. One was individual photography, um, working through their own experiences. And so you can find that on the individual. This is the collect, what you see up here are the collective photos that they took to um, express the, the themes and what they were grappling through as a group. So I invite you um, af after this to, to walk, through, walk through that. <coughs> Um, I'd like to take the chance really for to ask one question before opening it up for questions um, from the group. Uh, we have the opportunity, you all have an opportunity to influence how we think about truth commissions and truth seeking processes in the future. What is one thing that you would, um, from your experience, that you would want to bring forward as best practice, as what we should be doing? Way that ways that we can be supporting these types of processes in the future. What is one thing you would like to share uh, with the group? Should I start with you, Karina? Muchas gracias, Lady. Okay. Okay. 
Bueno, en general, una de las de lo que el grupo eh, primero buscó o encontró era ser escuchado. ¿sí? So, so one, one of the first things the group sought um, was to be heard. Eh, vimos que a través de la fotografía and we found that by using photography encontramos un medio eh, para comunicarnos they found a medium we found a medium to uh, communicate with others para soltar también porque pues esto es un proceso que no es fácil de un día para otro and also to let go because this is not an easy process from one day to the next y eh, esas dos cosas fueron muy sanador en general para, para todo el grupo. And those two things were really healing for the whole group. Muchos se sintieron eh, que era la, o nos sentimos, porque para mí también fue la primera vez eh, que, que fui escuchada o que me tomaron en cuenta. So for me, um, for, for for all of us, but I guess I can say for myself, this was the first time I felt heard, that I felt seen. So we were able to see that we were important um, with the diversity within our group, that we had something to say. Eh, entonces, en mi caso, yo y en el de todos, lo más importante fue es, eh, escucharnos. Mm, so in my case and in our group's case, it would be that um, to be, it's so important to be heard. Poder expresarnos a través de la fotografía y logramos soltar, soltar cosas que teníamos que soltar y fue muy sanador. And so through, and using photography, we were able to... Um, let go and things that we needed mm -hmm. to be let, let go of, which was very healing. Gracias, Leslie. Thank you so much. Father, I'll ask you. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not an easy question because there are so many perspectives to take into consideration. But first of all, and I appreciate a lot this moment because you invited victims, even Tecla. Tecla is, is coming from a community that suffered a lot because of the conflict in Kenya. Mm, that will be my first point. Take people into consideration and human being and the truth of human being. Mm, we in Colombia, we separated the judiciary truce, which is done by the special jurisdiction for peace, from the human truce, the historical truce, the political truce, the moral truce, the moral responsibilities. And in my opinion, this is a good point for any truce commission in the future. I also will invite you in the creation of a, a new Truth Commission anywhere to take care of yourselves. I mean, take care of the people participating in the Truth Commission because they, this is something that I have in my heart, the feeling that I not support sufficiently. Women, 70% of our group are women women and men working in the Truth Commission because it's very, very hard receiving all the time the suffering of the victims and also the confusion of the perpetrators and the questions of the victims asking for explanation, explanation, the reasons, what happened, who were the responsibles, why they do this against us. And this is very hard all the time. People, people finally is immensely affected and they have to, to pass through weeks in their families. Mm. 
I also will invite to be very courageous. We have to confront, really, for instance, in Colombia, it was very important to be very clear about the false positives. I mean, you know the, the story about 80,000 young people who were detained by the militaries in Colombia, poor people from very poor areas of the cities, and especially small farmers, campesinos, peasants, they were killed. In Yopal was the river, you know that, in Casanari, uh, in your region. Uh, they were killed by the militaries, and they were presented as terrorists killed in combat, a big lie. Never were the combats. They were not even left-wing people, just very, very poor, very insignificant people they could kill and present as triumphs on the battlefield. And these military were recognized as heroes in the war. And a question I have of, of Catholic, in all the battalions in Colombia, or battalions in Colombia, there were false positives. And we have, we have um, chaplains, Catholic chaplains, in a Catholic army. How is it that something that so awful could happen among us without a clear reaction of the church? Um, we have also Jesuit chaplains there. This is a question very hard for us. We have to be very, very courageous also confronting displacement, abusing of women in Colombia, disappeared people, more than 120,000 people disappeared. And we saw especially women searching for their lost ones everywhere in the country. Um, and finally, I will invite I will invite any truth commission really to be very serious in confronting the military solution, considering that through weapons you could get security. This is a big mistake. The the only thing that really give you security is in the communities. The communities have a lot of ways of creating and increasing trust among us. But the moment you introduce weapons, the very moment you do that, you destroy the trust in the community. Because you think by, the, by weapons, you could get, you could get uh, trust. Um, so please, the, the, the basic point here is, human beings, women, men, children. That, that's the basic message of it. I mean, the truth commission and the, the human truth. Thank you so much, Padre de Derru. Tecla. Um, before joining the truth commission, I worked as a relief and rehabilitation coordinator for over 40,000 victims of ethnic clashes. And for five years, I had shed so much tears. And for me, the Truth Commission was affirming those tears. I just wanted the tears that we had shed with women and other victims to be affirmed on the Truth Commission. And the undeniable truth all the sufferings, all the atrocities that were committed in Kenya had been documented. We have one of the strongest civil society organizations, human rights groups. They had documented all that. It's one thing reading about that. It's another thing when an eight-year-old woman refuses to say her testimony in privacy and says, I was raped and I want the world, I want Kenyans to know what happened to me. So it's one thing reading about 
an eight year or a young woman was raped. But it's another thing when she stands there before the media, before the public, and she narrates what happened to her. Another thing is um, the shame. The shame that as a nation we went through as we listened to what happened to each one of us. If you go to Seattle University, you will have a glimpse of all the reports of Kenyan Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there is a picture that is always stuck with me, where in one of the hearings, we had these top government leaders who are commissioners, who are district commissioners, district officers, during the massacres that took place, seated on one side, as adversely mentioned people, and next were these women in white who was sharing the same room during the hearing. And as the hearings were taking place, all you could observe was tears flowing. It's an image that a nation can never forget. And I know, even if the report of the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission has not been implemented, it's going to take a really gut for somebody, again, for a government official to commit the atrocities that Kenyans experienced in the past to the extent to what we shared. And so for me, I think that is the purpose that the Truth Commission uh, uh, had to contribute. But I wish Leslie you had asked me why not to set up a truth commission. Because there is a tension between truth commissions as a transitional justice mechanism with the principles of international criminal law. And because of the justice component, because of the lack of amnesty, we set up this truth commission in Kenya, spend a lot of money. The adversely mentioned people did not come forward. So it was a monologue. But reconciliation to take place, we needed to hear from the victims and also the perpetrators. But the perpetrators or the adversely mentioned people shied away from participating. And those even who participated denied the truth. And you can imagine what that did to the victims. Or some were so arrogant because they claimed they acted on behalf of the government. So when it comes to truth commission, where does the bug stop? Is it the officer there? with a gun who perpetrated? Or is it the president who by then was the chairman of the security council that sanctioned the massacre? So there are a lot of other questions also. Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you, Takla. Um, just th thank you for bringing up also the hard questions of why and when and how to set up a truth commission or in these experiences. Um, Marcela, I'll turn it to you. Okay, well, um, from my perspective, in our perspective, from the group, I think many things can be done, obviously, but um, we are so many, and we are asking for so many things. We, we know that. Um, it is difficult as a victim to recognize the, the person who did the criminal things uh, to be at the same level as us. Uh, you cannot ask us to be fine with the perpetrator in front of you saying, oh yeah, I did it. It's, it's hard, it's pretty hard. And not being hurt 
or not seeing justice with them is like, what is going on? Like, really? <laughs> because sometimes we can see that the perpetrators receive more than we receive. And we're like, this is kind of unfair. That is one thing. We really want justice, not revenge, but justice, like the law there. That would be great. The other thing that we really want uh, as a victims is to be listened, uh, not re victimized, not left alone in another country. And even if the government is like, you know, we are going to do the recuperation and we are going to do something with you, we are going to give you some money. It sounds interesting. Colombians are very attractive to money, unfortunate. And it's like a way to, okay, take it, fine, it's done. We just did our part. That is not enough. That is not bringing family back. That is not healing anything. It's just like, okay, it's paying for maybe rent, maybe some food, I don't know, in the short term. But that's it. Maybe you can work with education because the people that is like us, when we are victims, we are left alone with education. You can imagine what is going to be next, you know? People living with resentment because they, they don't have opportunities. They are left behind. You know what happens. It's not the, the, the thing that we want in a country. It's like going to be like a circle going, coming back. And the feeling of revenge, with seeing the perpetrators receiving more than us, is going to be like, a, okay, we don't want this to happen again. And obviously, it would be great since we are seeing two phases of the story, the one that when you are in Colombia and the other one when you are in exile, is when you go to the consulate asking for help just to be, uh, I don't know, with the help with the process, with your visa or whatever, and not be left to in a waiting list like for eight years, not receiving your papers, just going back and forth with so many things. Like you, at the end, you're like, a, you know, forget it. I just try to do my best and survive. And that is so painful because you have to deal with uh, that you don't have money, that you are in another country, that you left your family behind, that you really want to go back and that you are sad, that you are traumatized. And then you're re-victimized and just left behind with all the paperwork that you have to go through. That is, that is horrible. And I think the last thing that I want to um, share with you it is obviously if you work with communities, not just only ask for things from them, like information and all the, the gossip, you know, because obviously that's, that's nice, but and numbers don't say anything, actions do more. And if you want to contribute, please go to the communities, work with them to uh, counseling, through education, through, I don't know, things that really are worth it. You know, that's, that's really good. Uh, like this program was really nice. We, we cry a lot. We, we, we definitely were desperate at the time. Obviously, it was the pandemic. We were left alone, and obviously, in, obviously, in another country, having a psychologist working with that, it was like, like the best, you know, more than money. It was like, oh my God, thank you. And this result, because we have the pictures, we have our words, we have a web page, and we have a book that I really want to share with you. These great news. It's like our memories shared, and. Is, is more than we can expect. We are very, very privileged. And thank you, thank you, everyone. And thank you, especially. And I would like to um, take the opportunity, uh, since this is the launch of the book, <laughs> you can go online and see it uh, by yourselves, because we don't have too many copies with us, uh, to take the opportunity to give uh, the copy to the persons who were behind with the process, and obviously with Father Francisco de Rue and Tecla. Thank you. Quieres pasar? Quieres pasar?
Thank you so much. I want to thank all the panelists. Um, thank you for this book, for this memory, for this, the courage to be here, to be speaking here, to, uh, to the group, to all of the participants of Oto Diaspora who are represented here. Um, I think um, we're just at the top of the hour. I think I'll go with one round, one round of questions. Um, Jenna, is Jenna, you have the, the mic for two in the room. And if there's one, Carla, if someone online wants to read out, I think Carla. Yes, and we would like to give the opportunity for any students in the room to have first dibs on the question. Um, otherwise, we will go to the general audience. OK, we will open it up to the general audience now. Oh, thank you, thank you for for such um, a great testimonies of of what we have lived. Um, two words resonate uh, a lot, uh, and they are reconciliation and shameness. And I think that the combination of these two were like key. But then Marcela said, and I didn't get exactly pro probably. The 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 the, um, the deepness of 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 your of your um, of your uh, reflection regarding I don't want money I I it, it it won't bring back my family things like that. Um, my general question would be how the combination of reconciliation and uh, shameness of the society the collective would be. For, for a victim. Um, I, 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 these words were very powerful um, to me, more than the invitation of reconciliation. And we, I mean, we have been working a lot on reconciliation. And there are testimonies and there are a lot of good things um, to reflect on. But, but probably uh, listening and hearing some uh, shameness as society, as a collective, would probably feel better. So these reconciliation and, 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 and shameness resonate a lot. So I don't know, probably a reflection on that and, and, and for the you know, construction of these kind of mechanisms in to, to, to heal conflict. Thank you. Is there, before we move to that question, is there another question in the room? In the back? And if you could please give your name. Uh, my name's Shamil Idris. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all so much. Um, you've all expressed thanks to us, and I think we really owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, Tekla, you, you mentioned the need to, after the scandal with the chair of the commission, that there was a need to rebuild people's trust in, in this entire process. And you said you spent a lot of time on that. Can you share a little bit of what you actually did to accomplish that trust building? Thank you. Okay, so we'll have Tekla, if you can take that question, and then also a reflection on reconciliation and, and shame, collective shame. Uh, I didn't share in details about um, the challenges uh, affecting our chairperson. Um, the chair, our uh, our chairperson, he is late now. May his soul rest in peace. Worked as a top government official in the regimes that were under investigation. In top, he was uh, an envoy to great nations in the British, Britain, I mean, and um, in France. Uh, he also worked as um, a permanent secretary when uh, his uh, minister was assassinated. Uh, he was uh, in a security team meeting, and after three days, a massacre took
took place. He benefited from illegal and irregular allocation of land. And so in essence, uh, victims wondered how he was going to chair the commission that was investigating his bosses and in essence himself. And they shied away from participating in that process. And so when I took over, I remember a daughter of one of uh, a minister who was assassinated. Uh, she came, we had a meeting with her. And uh, the way I shared with her, the way I convinced her that it was going to be shared, I remember when she said, when she left, she told people that when I met the acting chair, I could trust that. So that trust, and I think it's in the demeanor. And uh, I think it's in the looking at the past character of whoever is in that position. And we had a lot of also, uh, a lot of uh, uh, outreach to communities, uh, encouraging them to come and participate, encouraging them the process is going to be fair and we are going to be uh, truthful. So that is what we did. Thank you. Thank you, Tekla. I know we have one question here, and then I want to end with the, the reflection on shame and reconciliation. Thank you so much for sharing your own experience, because I guess sometimes we try to elaborate a lot on the institutions and on the policies and on the instruments and not on the human experience. And I do believe institutions and policies are the results of human beings. So thank you so much for bringing in your personal experience and your spiritual experience. And my question would be, for those of you who would like to answer, which would be the one thing you will teach the children of your countries in order to avoid repetition? If there is one thing you should teach them, which would be this? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So if we have a reflection on, on that question as well as the gentleman about shame and reconciliation. Thank you, Maria. Maria is part of the w fantastic women we had and we have today at the Colombian Truth Commission. No, just I will teach vulnerability to the children. Vulnerability, vulnerability in the meaning of allow you to be vulnerable to the suffering of other people. You know, because uh, be, be open to the suffering of other people in, in the middle of, of, of a dramatic, of a tragic situation. It's absolutely important because people try to protect themselves. They knew the truth, but they try to protect themselves, the, the, the emotions, the, the emotions to come. And it is impossible to have a, a moral perspective if you don't suffer with the people who are suffering around you. And, and, and this is a habit. It's, it's, it's not easy at all to, I mean, to transform the ch children, to open them. Um, and also, but I'm, not, I'm not going to, to abandon on that on human dignity. Thank you. Tecla, Mar Marcela, would you like to respond to either of those questions? Or Karina? And then we'll wrap up. Okay, that's good. Um, about Maria's question, um, what to teach about our kids? <laughs> um, I have a niece, and she didn't know about the experience of um, her grandparents. And she's like, what? This is not true. This doesn't happen. Nowadays, kids are more on social media, and they don't care that much about what is going on with politics and everything. It's kind of weird just to see that. Um, I think um, a 
values are very important, especially in Colombian culture, since um, uh, there is skepticism with the government, uh, there is fear, um, there is not empathy sometimes, because we, we don't think that those things happened, since we don't see it that much anymore. It was very common at our time. Like, oh, it was a bomb, it was a um, massacre, massacre, um, things like that. And we were so scared since we, we lived that. But for the kids right now, it's like, a, mm, yeah, it, it doesn't feel the same. It, it, it is different. And I think that's why nowadays uh, the young um, population is more open to peace, which is good. And the old generation is like, no, or yes, please, peace, but with justice. It's like, uh, like, like I said before. Um, I think and to tell the truth to them would be great, that they know what happened and doesn't repeat again. It would be good too. So let me start with the last one. <laughs> what will I teach my children or my child? Though I will not have one, um, <laughs> that one is the last one. Uh, but to the young generation, I will always encourage people to look beyond someone's behavior to what may have molded that person to behave in that way. Especially coming from communities affected by childhood trauma, affected by historical trauma. Uh, the enemies in the communities at times is because of what we've heard about that uh, community. So it's always good to look beyond the behavior to what may have made that person into who that person is. Concerning reconciliation and shaming, um, ours is usually ethnic clashes. And I usually compare it to mob justice. I don't know if you, some of you have a concept of mob justice. For example, in Kenya, uh, a child, a street child may snatch a handbag from a woman because he's looking for some money for to buy some food, and the justice will be the mob will come and start beating that child, stoning that child, even at times to death. And I think in ethnic conflict, that is what happens. Like the militia groups, they act in a group. We are victims, we are going to revenge. It's one thing acting in a mob, and it's another thing when you are on your own and you are now called upon to look at that character. You don't have this comfort of the other mob, but you are on your own and you have to reconnect to your humanity. That is what I call, it's, it's really shaming. And for a nation, Kenya internationally is known as this beautiful country, the head for the UN, it had been an island of peace. But what the communities, some communities were experiencing underground had not been exposed. And it was through the truth-seeking process that these things were exposed and it shamed all of us. And I think we shall be more careful the way we deal with each other. Thank you. Thank you. And then Karina would just close your remarks. Gracias. Eh, creo que para tener o eh, educar unos niños, I think to educate the children, que vayan a hacer un mundo mejor, so that they have a better world. Como padres o como adultos debemos sanar ese corazón. Mm. That as adults and as as parents we need to heal. Eh, enseñarles la verdad. And we need to teach them the truth. 
pero sin, sin odio ni rencor. But without hatred and bitterness. Lo he visto con mis sobrinos, dos sobrinos. I've seen it with my nephews. Mm, educados eh, con valores, con principios. Who have been educated with values and principles. Y mi hermana con, con un corazón sano. And my sister with a, a heel, um, heel Para heart. no sembrar el odio en ellos. En to, ellos. to not breed or seed um, hatred in their hearts. Es como mi experiencia personal en cuanto a los niños. That's my personal experience with, with kids. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to this panel. Um, I actually want to respond to the question on, sh on, on shame uh, because I, I feel this, again, I, I mentioned this is a privilege for me to be here, but um, because I, I grew up in Colombia and um, so many times coming back through the United States, through Miami, through Miami I was put in the agricultural line and it was a, a deep moment of like shame and anger because there's so much more to Colombia than being put in you know the 90s of course there was you know the large drug trade and everything um, but that constant reminder like they didn't even ask like the minute you were, got off that plane you were put in that line everyone else could go who are coming from other countries um, but it made me so angry because that's not the that's not what I lived it, um, it didn't express who Colombia was um, and so I've been a big promoter of Colombia I mean a big uh, campeona for, the, for Colombia, but this last summer going back and seeing the, the end of the Truth Commission and four years of engaging as a society, grappling with, um, and, and since the signing of the peace agreement, and even before that, there's so many initiatives of peace throughout the country. Um, what I found phenomenal were two artists when we were in Comuna 13 in Medellin, who were young, young youth who were painting and, and describing the, the, the horrors and the challenges, but also the hope. And they were putting it up and they were facing it and we were facing it. And I think the Colombian society was, has, there was a space that I felt was really different when I was in Colombia this summer, 2022, that there was a space to face what we have lived. And I think that needs to continue now with the ongoing legacy of the Truth Commission as we grapple with everything that came out in those 11 books, um, it'll take years for us to grapple with that. So I just, I wanted to leave there though with turning that shame into, um, you know, facing, facing it. And I think that is, that is what you all have, have done. Being here, uh, Marcela and Karina, really the courage to be here for creating this book, for representing your group. Padre, thank you for being here, for, for you and Tecla leading these works. Um, in both of your countries, it's truly inspiring. And thank you to the Keough School, to the Catholic Peace Building Network, to Humanity United, to the University of Amherst, all who have been supporting um, this event. Uh, and thank you to you all for staying. We invite you to stay, take a look at the photos. Uh, Karina and Marcela are here to talk about them more, and we also have lunch out in the lobby. Thank you so much.